kidnapped and converted. Christian girls are being singled out for trafficking. I feared they would demand a lot of money to return her. Find out why the government is turning a blind eye. Plus, investment guru Kim Foss shares how to manage your money and keep more of it. And then, toxic, constant yelling. Looking for love in all the wrong places. I felt used. I felt like a piece of me. How she healed her heart. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. We were told Al-Qaeda was on the run. Almost over. It was all finished. The war of terror is over. And suddenly, America is on the run, and all of our embassies around the Middle East and Africa and so forth are closed down. Why are we hunkered down, afraid of a few terrorists? Well, Americans and foreign nations are facing a deadly terrorist threat. And the U.S. embassies in 19 cities in the Middle East and Africa will stay closed this whole week. We are hunkered down, Terry. We are, and the State Department has closed them because intelligence reports have showed that high-level al-Qaeda terrorists are planning what they're saying is a major attack. Ephraim Graham has the story. U.S. officials called the intercepted threats against Americans serious and credible. Nearly two dozen embassies and consulates across the Middle East and North Africa are closed. And the State Department says they could stay that way through the end of the week. We've received information uh, that high-level people from al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula uh, are talking about a major attack, and, and these are people in a high level. This threat was so specific as to how uh, enormous it was going to be, and also there were certain uh, dates were given, uh, but it didn't specify where it's going to be. Officials say the plot is considered, quote, very active, and al-Qaeda could change its tactics now that the U.S. is aware of key details of the planned attacks. It's being led by Nazar al-Wuhashi, Osama bin Laden's former personal secretary. He's based in the Arabian Peninsula, home to the most deadly of all the al-Qaeda affiliates. One surprise, according to authorities, al-Qaeda operatives talked about the plot, possibly knowing it would be intercepted. This is a wake-up call. Al-Qaeda is in many ways stronger than it was before 9-11 because it's mutated and it's spread and it can come out of some different directions. Intelligence officials say they don't know the exact nature of the threat, but they say Al-Qaeda has been working for years on bombs that can't be detected, like liquid explosives or bombs they implant in their own bodies. Their expertise is chemical explosives hitting the aviation sector, uh, as we saw with the, uh, the underwear bomber. So. We are on a high state of alert. The U.S. has also issued a travel alert to Americans abroad, warning them to stay away from public transportation and tourist hotspots. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. Well, joining us now is our CBN News terrorism analyst, Eric Stackelbeck. Eric, we have a president who told us Al-Qaeda is on the run. Are they on the run? Pat, as you said in the intro, we are now on the run. The United States of America, the mightiest country in the world, we are closing embassies throughout the Middle East and North Africa because Al-Qaeda is not only not on the run, they're on the upswing, Pat. Al-Qaeda now covers more geographical ground around the world than they did on 9-11. That is stunning. After all the blood and treasure we've put into this war on terror over the past 12 years, Al-Qaeda is still expanding, still growing. Not only Al-Qaeda Central Pad and their various affiliates in the Middle East, in North Africa, in South Asia, but we have this whole network of sympathizers in Europe, in America, who have sprung up. We saw it most clearly, Pat, back in April in Boston <laughs> with two young Islamic jihadists not directly linked to al-Qaeda, shut down a major American city for the better part of a week. Now, major American embassies and consulates are shut down throughout that region for all of this week, Pat, and it shows that our policies in the Middle East right now in the Muslim world are an absolute shambles, and we have no respect there any longer. Well, can we strike back? Is there something we can do? Well, what we should have done way before Benghazi and the mayhem that happened there last September, Pat, was fortify these embassies and consulate. Look, 
you don't want a situation where you have armed fortresses, where these embassies turn into some just, just armed, heavily uh, fortified, massive fortresses. But if you're going to be in those countries and there is a constant terror threat, then yes, you're going to have to fortify those embassies and consulates. And the jihadist pat in that region, they took notes after the Benghazi assault last September and they said, hmm, these embassies are really open season. These are easy, soft targets. And if they can hit us here, Pat, on the U.S. mainland, they will target U.S. Uh, installations and soft targets overseas. And that's really the crux of this whole terror threat we're seeing right now and this big alert. Well, Eric, why are they tipping us off? Usually they want to do this thing surreptitiously. Now this is the, they're, they're blasting it out so they knew we'd pick up the signal. What's the deal? Yeah, it's interesting, Pat, because apparently over the past few months, there was no chatter in these various jihadi forums. Why are they tipping us off? Maybe to divert our attention. Uh, maybe there is something else in the works. Hopefully not. But that may be the case here. They are working diligently every day, Pat, too. They'd love to carry out, look, another 9-11 style attack. That may not be in the offing, at least in the immediate future. But in the meantime, they have shifted their tactics to hitting easier targets. And these embassies and consulates, again, like we saw in Benghazi last year, are easy targets, unless we're going to heavily fortify them and have mini fortresses throughout the Middle East and North Africa. If we're going to stay there, that might be what we're gonna, going to have to do. Eric, they have bombed airplanes. They have bombed trains. They have, uh, of course, in, in uh, Israel, they've blown up marketplaces and restaurants and mm -hmm. places where people gather. Could they do something here in America? They absolutely could. I mean, look, you look at the Israeli model, Pat, as you mentioned, shopping malls, buses, schools. I am frankly shocked. Thank God, shocked, but I'm grateful that that has not happened here since 9-11. But the intent is there. And if you look at a Ford Hood, you look at what happened in Boston, you look at the attempted Times Square bombing a few years ago, Pat, these were softer targets in civilian areas. So this is what they want to do. We've had a combination over the past 12 years of great law enforcement, great intelligence work here in the U.S., also a good bit of luck. But absolutely, Pat, that soft target blueprint. I'm not necessarily looking for the next 9-11. I'm looking for the next Boston bombing. I'm looking for the next Fort Hood. That is the blueprint now. And by the way, Pat, just a quick point with this embassy threat. Al-Qaeda is not the only group threatening U.S. embassies. Just two weeks ago, a leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, our old friends, threatened a siege of the U.S. embassy in Cairo. Now, they're supposedly our allies in the Middle East, but all forces are against us now in the Muslim world, clearly. You know, it's like a body. If your body's strong, various pathogens can't hurt you. They can come against you, but your body resists them. Is our body weak here in America? Is it because of the, the people who are running the country? Very weak, because they fail the first rule of war, Pat. Know your enemy. Not only do we not know the enemy, we can't even identify and acknowledge the enemy. We can't use words like jihad, like radical Islam, like Islamo-fascism. These words have been struck from the record. They are not allowed to be used. And if we can't, if this is like during the World War II, Pat, with the Nazis not being able to call Hitler and his war machine Nazis. I mean, this is the equivalent. If you can't call the enemy, Al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood, the Iranian regime, Hamas, if you can't call them Islamists, what can you call them? Oh, violent extremists. That's what the administration uses now. That is our lexicon. So it starts at the top. Acknowledge what we are up against. We are in an existential, civilizational struggle. They are playing for keeps, are the Islamists. We need to acknowledge that, yes, we are in a civilizational struggle, a war against these folks. We did not declare it. They did against us. But now that we're in it, we're going to have to fight it and we're going to have to win it. And right now, I think we're losing on many fronts. Eric, thank you. And this book, Eric's written, by the thank way, you. is called The Brotherhood, America's Next Great Enemy. Uh, it's chock full of information. I think you'd be very helpful. It's available in bookstores or online. Uh, Amazon et al. Uh, it's called The Brotherhood by Eric Stackelbeck, our terrorism analyst. Man, Terry, it's, it's, it's terrible. You've got a, there's an article about uh, uh, Putin who decided why not 
rub America's nose in the mud. Why not uh, with uh, take Snowden in? Mm -hmm. Why not? Because uh, he looked and charted over the over the, the months the, the the failures of Obama to react to to insults to America, and he realized he can do whatever he wants to with impunity. And this is the way we are. We have not been stronger with this president. We are much much weaker, and that's dangerous for all of us. Well, here at home. A new report says the domestic spying scandal could have been even worse. Lee Webb has that story from the CBN newsroom. Here's Lee. Pat, other government agency, as it turns out, uh, want a piece of all that info that the National Security Agency has been collecting in its massive electronic surveillance program. A former senior intelligence official tells the New York Times that the NSA usually turns down requests from the DEA the Secret Service, the Pentagon, and Homeland Security. He says NSA officials worry, if you can believe this, that other agencies might abuse that information. He admits the NSA spying has been bad, but it could have been, as Pat said, much worse if it had given some of that info to the other agencies. Well, you will have to live under Obamacare, but Congress won't. Senators, representatives, and their top aides will be able to stay in their current health care system so they will still get a taxpayer-funded contribution to help pay for their health plans. That's because of a last-minute deal worked out before Congress went on vacation for five weeks. The deal gets Congress out of the original language of Obamacare. Sugary drinks raise the risk of obesity in very young kids. A new study looked at nearly 10,000 children between the ages of two and five, and it found that even two-year-olds may be headed for extra weight if they drink those beverages daily. A study from the University of Virginia was published in the journal Pediatrics. Some children's experts say parents should give their children fruit juice or milk and discourage them from routinely drinking soda and other sweetened drinks. Pat? Thank you. Isn't that amazing? Congress passes this awful bill, <laughs> awful bills, hated by Americans, hated. Unbelievable. But they exempt themselves. Yeah. They do the same thing with retirement benefits. You know, we're forced to go under various plans that they have set up for the workers, but not them. They've got this cushy retirement program. It's all cut out just for their staff and government workers, et cetera. It's so bold. It's you're almost yeah. embarrassed for them. <laughs> One of the reasons people so disgusted with Congress. I mean, yes. we have good friends in Congress, obviously, but this kind of stuff is is outrageous. Harry Reid did it. Harry Reid, head of the Democrats, he's the one who made a deal with the president at the last minute to slip this thing. Actually, the law uh, put them in, and all of a sudden they, they woke up. They you know they didn't read the bill like anybody else, and they they said, well, wait a minute, <laughs> we're under this awful system. You've got to get us out it's of it. It's good for so, them, but not us. <laughs> that's right. So Obama says, okay, Harry, you you've got a deal, and they, and they they put a little bit of last minute language in, slipped it through. People don't watch that stuff. But it's there, and it's the kind of thing that makes Americans furious, Terry. And should. Yeah. <laughs> well, still ahead, can't keep track of your spending? Not sure where your money goes? Well, stay tuned. The financial queen, Kimberly Foss, shows you a simple way to reconnect with your money. That's coming up. But first, abduction and forced conversion. That's what young Christian girls face in Egypt. Meet a family forced to flee their home in order to protect their daughters. I'm Cecil Gaines. I'm a new brother. A father bound by duty. I want to hear all the stories. I don't know how many stories you're going to hear because it's for him to some kind of secret code. A son fighting for change. There's this black power movement. I gave him the green light to gut those people. This country treats us like dogs. They're going to kill you. A mother protecting her family. Get the hell out of here. I'm yeah. sorry, Mr. Butler. I didn't mean to make fun of your hero. Everything you have is because of that butler. Lee Daniels, The Butler. Rated PG-13, August 16th. Tomorrow. We became his wives as opposed to his children. The co-owner of the Texas Rangers talks about her twisted childhood. We did all the cooking, cleaning, and eventually it led into wifely duties. And her years of numbing the pain. I used sex to be able to love. The pivotal question that erased her past on tomorrow's 700 Club. They said, does anybody have a prayer need?
called the religion of peace. Does that allow people to kidnap Christian girls and forcibly convert them to Islam? Imagine living in fear that you could be kidnapped at any time. That's what life has been like for young Christian girls in Egypt. And other Christians have suffered terrible attacks from Muslims there for years. Even more so since the ouster of Mohammed Morsi. Gary Lane brings us their story from Minya, Egypt. Egyptian Christians are frequent targets of attack during times of political instability. As a minority in a Muslim country, they've also struggled for years, not only to protect their churches, homes, and businesses, but also their daughters. One of the challenges facing Christian families here, particularly in Upper Egypt, is the kidnapping of young Christian girls. It generally happens when the girls enter their teen years. So what are families to do about this? Some move away to Christian villages, relocating. But with that comes a whole new set of challenges. Manel moved her family from a Muslim village to a Christian one near Almenia. She wanted to protect her oldest daughter, Maryam, from abduction and forced conversion. She made the decision after noticing some Muslim girls and boys attempting to lure Maryam away from her family and faith. The girls used to tell Maryam, come with us, we will give you some money. You are having a hard life. The young boys were sending the young girls to do this. I feared they would kidnap her and then demand a lot of money to return her. Or they would return her and she wouldn't be in the same condition she was in as when they kidnapped her. Now, residing as strangers in a new town, her husband has difficulty finding work. I'm much happier now because it is safe for my daughters here. But there are not many work opportunities for my husband because few people know him here. Miriam's family borrowed money to buy food and make their house payment. They prayed God would provide help. She and her family are not alone. Last year, a Helsinki Commission hearing revealed the number of disappearances and abduction of Christian girls is increasing. Human trafficking expert Michelle Clark told of more than 800 cases. Still, many Islamic leaders and government officials debunk claims that Christian girls are being trafficked. They insist the conversions and marriages are not forced. They're simply the result of young love. Helmi El Said is Freedom and Justice Party Secretary for Giza. A boy and a girl from different religions love each other, and thus one of them converts his religion in order to get married. The problem is that families do not accept that. Also, the two religions, neither the church accepts any of its people to Islam because of love, nor Islam accepts this type of conversion. Syed claims it's a social problem that must be addressed, not a religious one. Earlier this year, the Coptic Orthodox Patriarch told me that efforts to prevent trafficking and forced conversions often fail. This is a very sensitive issue for us. We try with the government, with the local authorities. Sometimes we success, but sometimes no success. The Morsi government did little to curtail the trafficking. Political change gives many Egyptian Christians hope. They pray the next government will force police to treat Christian kidnapping complaints seriously. They also want to see the government prosecute the kidnappers. As for Maryam and her family, their prayers for help were answered. CBN provided them with the seed money needed to start a small clothing business. My daughters and I will tell people in the church that we sell new clothing and the profits we get will help buy clothes for my children and feed my family. May the American Christians who help us have a long life and may God be with them to help others like me to become self-supporting. Help that brings a glimmer of hope and a new beginning in Egypt. Gary Lane, CBN News, Cairo. It's tough in the world that's out there right now. God Almighty is in control. That's the hope we have. But this stuff cannot continue too much longer. But this is a vicious system that is bent on world domination. And I just would pray that somehow the American press and the so-called mainstream media and the think tanks and the universities and the government would have their eyes open to what we're dealing with. But we are looking at, as Eric said earlier, a clash of civilizations and terrible persecution of those who name the name of Jesus Christ. So pray for our brothers and sisters and those of us who live here in the United States. We're free and we're so grateful. But uh, keep in mind that there are those suffering for their faith. Terry? 
Well, up next, more month than money? No worries. Wealth manager Kimberly Foss shows you how to take control of your cash when we come back. Hi, my name is Breda. I'm just your typical nine-year-old. I love singing, dancing, reading, discovering the simple fruit. My grandpa says you're never too young or old to learn the value of a dog. He taught me the true value of this paper doll. You see this little gold coin? It says one dollar on it. But guess what? That was a long time ago. Today, this gold dollar is worth over a hundred paper dollars. This paper dollar is now only worth one penny compared to America's former money, the gold dollar. My grandpa says the only money we're saving today is real money, gold or silver coins. He's pretty smart. How our paper dollars lost their value, he says. It's all explained in a new book, The Great Debasement. It's easy and fun to read. If you call the number on the screen, I will send you a copy totally free. Next time, I will explain the simple truth about money. Jack and I are having the time of our lives. The kids are on their own, and now we're back in control of our time and the way we spend our money. That's why Consumer Cellular is the perfect cell phone company for us. We get great service, and compared to our old plan, we're saving a ton every month. Consumer Cellular is the wireless provider for people who want affordable service without the contracts. Listen, I don't think I'm cheap. I only want to pay for what I need. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what do you pay a month for Consumer Cellular? My bill can be as low as $10, $15 a month. Wow. But we can change our plan anytime. So even those months we use it a lot, we're always getting the best price. Try Consumer Cellular risk-free for 30 days with free activation, a $35 value, and free shipping. Consumer Cellular is the exclusive wireless provider for AARP members. Ask about your special discounts. Call Consumer Cellular at 1-800-730-5103. Go online to ConsumerCellularTV.com or visit a Sears store today. A few years ago, there was a commercial out, Do You Know Where Your Child Is Tonight? Well, our guest is going to say, Do You Know Where Your Money Is Tonight or Today? According to a Gallup poll, only 32% of Americans put together a budget each month to track income and expenditures, and just 30% have a long-time financial plan for savings and investment goals. And that means most people have no idea where their money is going or coming each month. With automated banking, bill paying, and online accounts, sometimes it's hard to know how much money you really have or where it's going. Kimberly Foss says it's time to reconnect with your money. She's a highly respected financial expert and a New York Times best-selling author. Kimberly also contributes frequently to Fox News, CNBC, and The Wall Street Journal. She gives practical, simple ways of keeping track of what you're saving, spending, and giving. Well, welcome back to the 700 Club, the founder of Empyrean Wealth Management and author of an intriguing new book, undoubtedly a New York Times bestseller called Wealthy by Design. Uh, Kimberly Foss, who is a certified financial planner, and uh, she's going to show us something right now. Kimberly, it's good to see you again. Nice to see you, Thank too. Thanks you. for having me back. All right. Before you are dollars and buckets. They're yeah. jars. Tell us what you do with those jars. Well, you know, I think there's a big disconnect in this age of digital that with our money and budgeting. Mm -hmm. So what I devised for my daughter actually started out, who just turned 21 yesterday, was to actually reconnect with our money. Okay. So if we take and we say 50% of our money goes for our core expenses. All right. Transportation, food, utilities, and housing. Okay. And that's it. So let's say if you had $1,000, 50%, so you've got $500. And that goes... Literally goes into, in the, the dollars go into your core. All right. You actually take the money and put you it in. You actually take the money and put it in. All right. That's, that's the... It's a physical connect. The, the, all right. That's the core. All right. Right. And then in your savings and debt reduction and tithing, of course, we want to put at least 30%. Okay. So you want to put that... Right in there. Three Benjamins. Okay. Three Benjamins. Okay. There you go. In you go. And then guess what? Everything else that we have to live on 
goes in this discretionary can, and that includes the flat screen TV, Pat. Not in that's not a core. Flat okay. screen TVs are not core. <laughs> All right. So that goes into here. All right. Okay. Then when we go ahead and take money out for the month for, let's say, uh, uh, groceries or something like okay. that, you would take it out and you would just put a piece of paper that said groceries and the date, put it back in there. Okay. And at the end of the month, these should be empty. I had one client at the end of the month basically had $100 left in her savings after okay. her physical savings. So what we did is with that is we took the money and we put it into this little savings jar, which you can't see through. And that's the whole idea is you can't see through that. So that is our savings for vacations, anything else you want to do so every month. That's black covered up. You, you, you can't see. You can't see through it. Okay. So you can't see through that one. How effective is this technique? It actually is very effective. I think I had um, a client this last month go through, and I call it the 30-day challenge. She went through it. And at the end of the month, she said she felt more connected with her money. She was more in control. Mm -hmm. She felt purposeful. And she felt like she actually could stay on a budget, and she had $100 left at the end of the month. Fantastic. It was really successful. Well, and the cool thing is, Pat, yeah. she wanted to do it for this next month. Great. You said that most people, because of the Internet, they, 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 they don't even get paid. They, they, their money is direct deposited in a bank account, and money is taken out. They don't really have a feeling where their money is. I think that's the really big cause of debt in this country and credit card debt. And even with the older generation, everything is so automatic, we lose that connection with our money. Let me tell you, if you go to the store and mm -hmm. you put your credit card for groceries, or if I give you that $100, let me tell you, it's, it, it's hard to give that $100 <laughs> away versus that credit I, I card. I might give so, this to some clerk in yeah, the grocery like, no, store. I don't, I don't my it's my budget. It's mine. Give it back to me. So what it does, it makes right. us more, meaning, more mindful of our money, mm -hmm. more accountable, more aware. And when you are more aware, of course, you're going to be more successful. And that's the whole idea. When people get into debt, there's a real depressing mm -hmm. part of debt, right? And people that already have $1,000 in debt, I might as well just do another 1000 But there's an opposite effect of that. There's a positive effect of seeing these Benjamins in that savings after right. the month and going, wow, there is a positive. Yeah. Exactly. And you get so excited. And then you have 200 and 300 And then you know what is? You make more mindful and better decisions with your money because you actually have savings. You don't want to save it. You don't want to spend it, I mean. You want to save it. Let me talk about you. You, you were, had a big family, and uh, you, your father was a carpenter, I believe. Just and, like uh, Jesus. You know, like Jesus. Well, how did you learn all this? Uh, you know, I think coming from humble beginnings, it really teaches you how to be grateful and thankful. And God just blessed me early on. I knew there was a purpose in my life, but it just made me more mindful. Uh, six children, baby of six, uh, we had no money. And mm -hmm. I hung sheetrock with my dad to, yeah. to earn dollars, yeah. And I, as we said before, earned uh, my first pair of Jordache jeans uh, yeah. by building a rock wall, a bucket, a bucket an hour. So I did that. But it made me connect when I figured out the money and earning. And then it gave me a choice in life. Mm -hmm. And that choice then, really for me, was able to go do God's will. What did, what did your family think about that? I mean, did they, they think that you were going out of your mind or were they very supportive? They, they think I was kind of crazy. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, my sisters and brothers I love them to death, but they didn't have that same, I don't know, the DNA was different. Mm -hmm. They always knew there was something with the connection of money early on. At least that's where the stories go. Okay. So. You know, I, this book is interesting, and uh, I, there's a chapter in here that I thought was fascinating. They had a financial meltdown, and you were right on top of everything that happened. The banks were going broke, and you pointed out that uh, some of the banks were kiting checks. And they were writing checks on money. They expected the TARP funds to come and bail them out. And they were desperate. And so one of your buddies in the banking industry called you, and you designed a plan, which I thought was, you, you even have a death put in there. I think that is something else for a little girl from <laughs> son, daughter of a carpenter to come up with a death put. And uh, uh, you, you had a, a call provision in there. It was extraordinary. Tell us about that. Well, thank you for that. It's a, I think it was a total God thing because uh, I was on my knees at 2 in the morning, and mm -hmm. I remember, and it was a very desperate time. People, our advisors were, were scared. Everybody was just paralyzed. Yeah. And I thought, you know, we can't just sit here on our hands and do nothing. So um, I came up with this plan when my friend called me from the bank, 
And the idea was that uh, I wanted to make sure that if somebody did pass away in a family, that they had their money back. So that's why I put the debt put, death put on there. Well, nobody, I mean, to think of a death put, I, I wish some of the, the <laughs> financial advisors that I deal with had much intelligence. Well, you, you structured, you had a senior note, so you, your people came out first. We, we did? You asked for a 15% coupon, <laughs> which is undreamed of, and uh, a death put, and uh, uh, you were protected for at least three years against a call. I mean, it was an extraordinary instrument. You drew all that up, the man, and, and you were loaning money to the bank. We were loaned to the big bank, and it was kind of a, you know, I called a bridge loan, so to speak. And they mm. were desperate, and they knew they had the TARP money coming. They just kind of didn't know the timing of it. So, you know, what it was, is, it was great. It was free markets. It mm. was a need for my clients, and free markets and, and, and the risk and reward for my clients was there, and we bridged that, and no government intervention. Did you feel like Warren Buffett, who also loaned them about five million? You know what? <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of mapped out about Warren Buffett, sort of on what they did with Goldman Sachs. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. It was great. Well, Thank what, you. It's an exciting life. Uh, how many clients do you have? You know, I have a very boutique business. I only have about eighty clients. Yeah. Yeah, I have two hundred million under management. So it's very boutique because I've got to balance it, and I know, and I have a family, and I've got a little eight-year-old still at home. My oldest just turned 21, so we've got two in between. Well, for each one, you have a customized program. Every one of yep, those clients. Every one. It's not. There's no. It's not a one-size-fits-all model. We have models, but then we have everybody's customized with that. So many brokers, they just want to. I mean, they're hired to to sell stuff, and they yeah. try to unload junk on their clients. Yeah, unfortunately, that is. I was a broker at one time in my past in the dark side of my life. Yeah. Well, that's what you were told to do, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, that was. It was, I was with Mother Marilyn, and it was what told, we were told and, to do. It was a great learning ground, though. But Mother Mother Marilyn, the, the, those brokers were told, uh, you know, this is garbage. They, they, they've got telephone calls of people talking to each other. They had to unload them on, on unsuspecting clients. And sadly, the industry is still a is lot it? of the same after 25 years. Haven't they learned? I, one would think. Yeah. One would think. But I, I think it's getting better, though. There are more fee advisors. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, that fee advisor takes that conflict of interest out of the picture. Okay. And that's the whole idea, is that the best thing for the client so they can go out and have their choice to do their free will, what God wants us to do. You were strong in fixed income, but it's really tough with 0% uh, interest to, 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 to get a fixed income. Uh, we're we're struggling. We were struggling, it? yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of my clients are on fixed income. But, you know, you also um, weave in the bonds uh, in the portfolio, but also, you know, good dividend-paying stocks like AT&T mm -hmm. and I have Chevron in there. And um, you just want to go ahead and put those into the portfolios as well. And also, I'm really doing some more of the structured notes again, too. They're nice if, yeah. you, if you can structure them the way you want. But you got to structure them the way you want, <laughs> right. There was none coming since, since 2008. I didn't like any, but now they're starting to... Loosen yeah. up the reins a little bit. Well, those CDOs and those, those things that they did is just unbelievable. The, I mean, it was, it was a lot of people, they, even the experts, couldn't understand the junk that was coming out of Wall Street. Oh, they couldn't was, understand them. No one did. No one did. No one, I mean, and like I said, until we actually went through and created and implemented that uh, senior note, I don't think you could. It, they're, they're, they're very technical as far as the triggers mm. and what happens. People have to understand what goes on if their money, um, you know, if it was triggered. How did the daughter of a carpenter learn all this? You are very sophisticated in your knowledge. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. It's a God thing. It's a God thing. It is. And you, you are on your knees praying and asking I, God for her. When you have nothing else and the whole world is melting down around you, <laughs> you that's when God really takes advantage of that, right? Sure. He wants us to be weak so that we turn to him, right? Ladies and gentlemen, it's called Wealthy by Design. This gorgeous lady on the cover is none other than Kimberly Foss, <laughs> so who's here with us. And uh, it's an amazing book, and I think you'll find it interesting, and we appreciate Kimberly. And you looking for any more clients? Or you? Got, oh, yeah, we're always you, looking for clients. Well, how do you get in touch with you if you want somebody who prays about your portfolio? Yeah. <laughs> We can go to KimberlyFoss.com. That's my website. And yeah. you can get the book on there. And, of, um, of course, it's all across 110 different uh, airports for the wow. next three months as well. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you, sweetie. God bless you. Bless you, too. Lovely lady. Terry, how about the apples? Learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Well, still ahead, we're going to bring it on with your email questions. Rob wants to know, what is the difference between carnal and spiritual Christians? You're going to find out coming up. Stay with us.
If you're living with diabetes and have Medicare or private insurance, here is some great news. Call United States Medical Supply today and we'll send you the smallest glucose meter in the world, absolutely free. It only takes a speck of blood and it gives me my results in five seconds. And there's no coding for easier, more accurate results. Don't let diabetes get in the way of living. Give us a call today at United States Medical Supply and get the smallest meter in the world for free. Is your child happy in school? Is the pace too fast or too slow? Does your child need a more flexible or individualized approach? You do have another choice. Online learning from K-12, a full-time alternative to the traditional classroom, available as a tuition-free public school option. Call now for your free information kit to learn more. K-12 is available through accredited public schools that parents and teachers enthusiastically endorse. I made a switch to online learning because I saw a blossoming of kids' excitement for education. Our state-certified teachers customize lesson plans and guide learning. Kids work at the level and pace just right for them without classroom distractions. And books and supplies are included. The ability to have the online school and still be part of a public school system is priceless. In fact, 97% of K-12 parents are satisfied their student benefits academically. Call now or go online for your free information kit. Welcome back to the 700 Club. The governor of Pennsylvania has taken steps now to prevent illegal same-sex marriages in one county. Last week, the Montgomery County Register of Wills defied a state ban on gay marriage and started issuing licenses to homosexual couples. In fact, he's issued at least 34. Governor Tom Corbett is suing County Register Bruce Haynes to make him stop violating the state law that defines marriage as between one man and one woman. Haynes started issuing gay marriage licenses after the state's attorney general said she would no longer defend the law. CBN is helping thousands of people affected by flooding in the African nation of Chad. Heavy rains and flooding destroyed mud brick homes, forcing villagers to evacuate. CBN responded by supplying a thousand mattresses with ground mats and a thousand mosquito nets. CBN also drilled several freshwater wells and built latrines in temporary refugee camps. Team members were also able to get a, give a short-term presentation of the gospel during their relief efforts. And you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to cbn.com international. Stay tuned. Pat and Terry will be back after this. In 2008, my husband Gary departed for heaven. I was still grieving. And then to find out I had cancer, I began praying, God, how do I do this? Where do I do this? Cancer Treatment Centers of America was the place. Dr. Neelam outlined a plan that would take care of my mind and my body, and she prayed with me. For Bible-believing Christians, we're able to pray with them in a much deeper way as they begin to really rely upon their faith. At Cancer Treatment Centers of America, we believe in the power of faith and prayer as indispensable allies in the fight against complex and advanced stage cancer. I'm back in Telluride on the mountain skiing. I feel strong and healthy. Advanced medicine and technology. And I am a survivor. The warm embrace of the spirit and the power of prayer. These are happy tears. Please go to cancercenter.com forward slash faith. Appointments available now. Cancer Treatment Centers of America, care that never quits. Tomorrow. We became his wives as opposed to his children. The co-owner of the Texas Rangers talks about her twisted childhood. We did all the cooking, cleaning, and eventually it led into wifely duties. And her years of numbing the pain. I used sex to be able to love. The pivotal question that erased her past on tomorrow's 700 Club. They said, does anybody have a prayer need? To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Well, we always enjoy receiving your email questions, and we want to take some time to answer them during our Bring It On segment today. Pat, this first one is from Rob, who says, what is the difference between carnal and spiritual Christians? Well, the word carnal comes from the Latin carne, which means flesh, and uh, the other uh, 
better description is what Paul says. He is translated natural man, but he uses in Greek the term psukikos, which means soulish. Psuke is the word for soul. Uh, the soulish man versus the spiritual man. Uh, the people who are natural are led by the lusts of the flesh. And that's why you find gluttony, you have adultery, you have fornication, you have witchcraft, you have envy, you have jealousy, all that stuff comes out of the flesh. It's carnal. And so carnal Christians are those who are dealing on that level. Spiritual are dealing with the spirit, which is that's which takes of God and, and is in tune with God. God communicates through our spirits. And we've never been told to stir up our flesh, nor have we been told to stir up our suke, our soul, our soul. He doesn't want soulish Christians. He wants spiritual Christians. So if, if that's, that's a real quick snapshot of what the difference is. Okay, this is Tina who says, I'm 16 and a great fan of your TV show. Where did you get the name The 700 Club <laughs> and what does The 700 mean? Well, that's a nice question. Years and years ago, we were struggling. I mean, struggling. <laughs> and uh, so I thought as I was praying and researching that if we could have 700 people who would give $10 a month, we'd meet our budget. I mean, wow. that's like 30 <laughs> seconds now, Not but really. that's it. All right. So I went on and did a telethon and uh, we, we got 333. <laughs> so we got half the goal. So it was a year or two later that we were doing this 700 Club telethon. And uh, we not only got the 700, we got more. We exceeded our goal and I think pledged $100,000. It was a wonderful breakthrough. Mm -hmm. But we thought, decided when we did a program that 700 Club was like James Bond 007. It sounded <laughs> like a nightclub. It sounded sort of... Uh, so you. So, so me. Yeah, you know how it is. I mean, we, we wanted to be a little hip. and that, So we had 700, uh, and that's where it came from. <laughs> that's okay. great. This is Allison who says, do you think people drank cow's milk back in Bible days? I've been hearing about so many negative side effects of cow's milk that it makes me nervous to introduce my toddler to it. Well, uh, we weren't supposed to drink cow's milk, but the, the, they really had sheep and goats. And goats, the, and yeah. The, yeah, and, and they had goat's milk, which was, uh, uh, but they made it into yogurt, and they had, you know, uh, curds and whey. Mm -hmm. uh, it was yogurt out of, uh, out of sheep, goat's milk. They didn't have, I mean, cows couldn't stand it in the desert, so, uh, yeah. but they did have milk from sheep. We, we don't keep sheep anymore uh, yeah, to, to give I us think milk. Medically speaking, too, they do say that goat's milk is more bent yeah. to human consumption. And well, uh, there's a, there were tremendous numbers of, uh, well, the people, uh, what are they, lactic acid intolerant. intolerant. Lactic and there are many people that have sicknesses because of uh, drinking cow's milk. It's, it's, it's uh, well, it, whatever. People are going now for soybean milk, and that's probably got problems into it, too. So anyhow, but <laughs> in, the Bible, in the Bible, that's what they did. What's next? <laughs> okay, this is Lisa who says, do you think having paid staff in the church is biblical? I don't see any of this in the Bible other than offerings to workers and churches and needs. Aren't all responsible for the work of the ministry? Why should we pay pastors and church staff? Well, if you want pastor working full time, he's got to have money from someplace. And... Uh, if you want him full time calling on the sick and visiting the hospital and preaching sermons and teaching and all the rest of it, somebody's got to pay him. And uh, the Bible indicates that uh, uh, those who feed the flock should share in the milk of the flock. Mm -hmm. So uh, you pay them a salary, or they, they, in some of these churches, they just take all the offerings, or they take 10% of the offerings, or 50% of the offerings, or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think most people would rather have a salary. I mean, mm -hmm. most churches would rather have a salary. Uh, but they're, but the, the Bible says that a workman is worthy of his hire. And I, I do think that we have to have paid uh, workers in Christian organizations. Otherwise, they're out uh, scrounging around, or they're poverty stricken. You don't want that. Running a church is a huge responsibility. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's huge. All right. Is that well, all? That's all for today. Well, thank you. It is. Well, imagine working every day of the week for 25 years. That was reality for a woman from Thailand named Tum, and still she could barely make ends meet. In 25 years, Tum has never had a day off from selling vegetables in the market. She goes to work even when she's sick. 
I work day and night and get hardly any rest so that my family will have food to eat. Unfortunately, most of the money Tom earned went to pay the rent on her stall in the market. She was deeply in debt and considered taking a housekeeping job at a hotel in another city. I needed that job because it paid more and we really needed it. But my family also needed me to be with them too. Tom provides for her elderly parents and two nieces whose parents abandoned them. When CBN's Orphans Promise heard about Tom, we helped her by giving her small business a boost. First, we paid the rent on her market stall for a year, and we gave her money to increase her inventory. Then we trained her to run the small business more efficiently. My income is now more than the amount that I would have made working in the hotel. We have everything we need for our family. With CBN's help, Tom has also prayed to become a Christian. God is blessing me in every way. Thank you, CBN. You kept our family together. I've never been so happy. There are so many people in countries around the world that are struggling just to survive day to day. When you join the 700 Club, you give us the opportunity to step right into the middle of that need and to provide for them, for their families, not a handout, but a hand up, a way to go on providing for their families and to make a living in the future. It brings hope and it also brings the love of Jesus Christ right into their hearts and lives. So if you're not a 700 Club member, what a great opportunity to join. All you have to do is go to your phone, call that toll-free number that's on your screen, 1-800-759-0700. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. And you will be joining with thousands of us who are out to touch the world and make a difference in the name of Jesus. When you do that, we want to say thank you for caring about others by sending you this latest teaching that Gordon has done called Our Father, Keys to the Lord's Prayer. We know this will be a great blessing in your life and you'll have the privilege of knowing that you are touching and blessing someone else's life at the same time. So please call now. Pat? This weekend I'm going with Scott Ross and our producer Edie Wasserberg. Scott's been on the street in LA and New York talking to people and we're going to be commenting on some of the questions, oh, the answers. And when things. are we going to get to see that? I think it'll be ready probably for fall or winter. I'm, I'm not sure when it'll be, but it'll, it'll, be, it'll be special. Great. We look forward to it. Well, I look you forward to, to it, posted. too. Well, coming up, a young woman looking for love in all the wrong places after her parents' divorce. I had my first boyfriend in the eighth grade, and um, in two months' time, we went from being afraid to even hold hands, just nervous around each other, to actually being sexually active. Watch what happens next. That doesn't sound like my kid time growing up, but in the eighth grade, wow. A lot of it was image. Uh, people would come to our house that we had to entertain. So we kind of had a house that we couldn't even afford. When the bills would come in and they would be past due, I would automatically get upset at Christian. We began to learn more about our finances and about giving, and that's when we decided to give to CBN. When you become obedient with your finances, there's so many other areas in your life that God opens up for you. Yeah, we just love We're Christian and Colleen Bunsley, and we give to CBN. If I can talk to anyone as much as I want to here, namaste, Ooh, masaledad, then why am I limited when I make international calls? Que pena. Exactamente, amiga. That's why we'll connect the world with one low rate for unlimited calls. So I can call China as much as I want? True that. And India? Ah! And I can call my girlfriend in Brazil. Claro! Over 60 countries. People thought we were crazy to give you unlimited long distance. Crazy, crazy generous! Feel free to talk at Phonics.com. Utter bliss. That's what Laura Gaylor expected marriage to be. All she had ever wanted was a stable, two-parent home where she could raise a family. But what she got was just the opposite. For Laura Gallier, the reality of her marriage was more like a nightmare. The atmosphere in our home was toxic. There was constant yelling, arguing. At times, it would get physical. This was the latest in a series of bad decisions that were based on Laura's need for male attention. This yearning began in her childhood. Her parents divorced shortly after she was born, and Laura missed her dad. 
I do um, have memories of him coming to see me, um, but I also remember the sad goodbyes at the end of the weekend and it feeling traumatic and him just not being a daily part of my life. At age eight, Laura prayed with a friend's mom to accept Christ, but her faith was never nurtured at home. I genuinely had a heart for God to learn more, to know Him. At the same time, you go from being a child to now this young teen and the temptations really hit. And you could say that I had a heart for God, but a mind for the world. Laura also missed her dad, and that void had consequences. I had my first boyfriend in the eighth grade. And um, in two months time, we went from being afraid to even hold hands, just nervous around each other, to actually being sexually active. That scenario played out time and again through her teens and early 20s. The faces changed, but the result was the same. I felt used. I felt like a piece of me was gone and missing. And ironically, the way I chose to deal with that was to go out and search with all my might for another guy to love me and to fill that void. All along, she believed she knew the solution. Laura met a guy in college and they started having sex. This time, it was different. I was in the middle of my sophomore year and I remember telling my roommate, you know, something is wrong. And I eventually took a pregnancy test and realized I was pregnant. So instead of breaking it off with this young man, we got married because I did not want to be a single mom. I wanted my child to have a mother and a father. The names we would call each other, the cruelty that we would come at each other with, it was vicious. I learned to cry out to God during that time because I was absolutely miserable. They tried to work on their marriage, but things never improved and they divorced. It was very sad to me. It felt like a death that that you know, relationship had come to an end, that I was prepared at that time to try to have a new beginning in life and try to not just think of myself, but my daughter. And what did she need moving forward? Laura started going to church every week. She also attended an Encounter God weekend where she learned how to get free from her past. I repented for my past um, rebellion and specifically the sexual sin that was such a part of my teen and young adult years. It was so liberating to learn that my happiness and contentment in life was not in someone else's hands. Just to know that I could count on the God in me and on the Holy Spirit and on the one who loves me perfectly. Over time, Laura learned more about God's love for her Finally, she met and married Patrick. Today, they are raising four children. Our family is built on the Word of God and on ministry, and we're raising our kids in the Word of God. Laura is now a writer and speaks to young people about how the most important relationship in life is the one we have with Jesus Christ. I have an intense gratitude to God for not giving up on me because I, I made promise after promise as a young lady and a teenager, promise after promise. I'm gonna live right, God, I'm gonna live right, God, I'm gonna live right, God. And I failed every single time. And um, that's the beauty of our God, is that He, he picks us up, He loves us, he's, he's present, even in those dark days. He'll teach us through, through pain and through suffering, He will. But all of that is His way of getting us right back where we belong, into His loving grace and acceptance. And where else can you find that? I was talking with someone in my family this weekend about that old saying, He looked beyond our fault and saw our need. You know, God, God knows who we are. He understands our flesh. It's not that He just glibly looks away and doesn't mind our sin. He understands we need a savior. That's why Jesus came, it's why he died, it's why he paid the heavy price that he did. Because you and I are sinners. The Bible says there's not one person who doesn't fall into that category. We all need a savior. So part of the journey is coming to the place of understanding that we fall short of the mark, that we need forgiveness, and then that it's available that God, in spite of that, 
in spite of that, waits for us, longs to have relationship for, with us. I love when Laura says how much she's grateful to the Lord for what he's done. You know, the Bible says the one who's been forgiven much loves much. When you realize who you are, where you've come from, what you've done, and how amazing God's love is, his grace and his mercy, it causes you to fall on your knees and say, God, thank you. Thank you for waiting for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for overlooking the things that I've done. And thank you for your willingness to change my life because God wants to do that for you and he wants to do it for you today. You can have the same start over, the same new beginning that Laura had. It's available to anyone who will fall before the Lord and say, God, take my life, forgive my sin, come into my heart. You see, it's not just the forgiveness. It's not just the surrender to him. There's a great promise as well that he'll live within us, that he'll move and live through us. And then here's Laura speaking to young people. Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So he takes the garbage and the junk of her past, and he uses it now to touch someone else's life with truth and with wisdom. Give God your junk today. He can turn it into something beautiful that matters, something that has eternal significance. Hard to believe? I know. I know, but it's real. He promises he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. There is nothing that can separate you from his love. So just ask him. Humble yourself today and say, God, I am a sinner in need of a savior. Forgive my sin today. Come into my heart, my life. Make a difference in me. And then ask him to fill you with his spirit. Being filled with the Spirit of God is what changes how we think. It's the thing that sets us on a course different than the course we'd ordained for ourselves. It's what happens when you come to that fork in the road and there's the way you would have taken and there's God's way. And you choose to walk with Him. He loves you so much. That's why this message is coming to you today because God has made a way for you to hear about His great love. He's made a way for you ha to have a turnaround in your life, a fresh start and a new beginning. Many of you may have things in your life that you have questions about, or maybe you need specific prayer about a need in your life. Call that number that's on your screen. It won't cost you a thing. It's toll free. 1-800-759-0700. There's someone on the other end of the line who's already prayed the prayer we're talking about, and they would love to pray with you today. So our phone lines are open 24 hours a day. Call now. Someone's waiting to hear from you. Pat? Thanks, Terry. Phones are available if you found the Lord. Listen, tomorrow we've got Travis Stork. He's going to give you a prescription for a healthy living that uh, you won't be afraid to take. And we leave you today with these words from Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. Well, that's all the time we've got. Thanks so much for being with us. For Lee and Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. We were so hungry. I carried my brother to my aunt's house to ask for food, but she didn't let us in. Vaughn was crying so hard because he was starving. I couldn't do anything to help him. There was a time when we didn't have food to eat for two days. My stomach hurt a lot. The food here is so good, and we get to eat three times a day. Thank you, CBN. These are the things you make possible when you partner with CBN. Thousands of people around the world begin new lives because you cared enough to give. To those of you who recently pledged to join the 700 Club, thank you. Your help will make a tremendous difference in so many lives. Please be sure to watch for this mailing and remember to send in your pledge because when we all come together to help, miracles happen.